Um, I've got to meet a new people, which is good. Um, hopefully, after the session, um, after the month finishes, if you want to create a corner at the pub or um, just have a chat and exchange details. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is WordPress.com and the difference between WordPress.org. And for beginners, we're going to cover everything right from the beginning. So um, we've also I'll be putting the slides posting the meetup, so you don't have to take notes, but of course, be free if you feel comfortable doing that. Plus, we'll also cover the next steps, um, which people usually, once they've um, you know, decided on their site, are picking a web host and choosing a domain name. So, who am I? Um, this is my sort of standard joke. It's about as funny as my sort of slides get, but um, that's the reaction that I usually get. So. <laughs> Maybe I won't next time. Um, worked in IT for quite a while. Uh, just uh, started working for myself. Uh, helping people usually on web projects. I've um, got a few of my own websites and I also do quite a bit of training, uh, mainly focused around web technologies. And I regularly go to meetups. So I know a few familiar faces here that go to a lot of other meetups. And someone introduced me um, last week at the SEO meetup as part of the furniture. So I don't know whether that's a compliment or not, but uh, I get a lot from it. And obviously, I love uh, coming along and sort of meeting people and getting inspired and motivated. So just to cover uh, sort of the agenda of the talk, we'll first of all talk about what is WordPress, just to get a really good, solid definition. Uh, cover WordPress.com and WordPress.org, because they are two different things. Um, some pros and cons of both, because there isn't really a better option. It just depends on what uh, suits a particular use. We cover a little bit about domains from an Australian perspective, and also web hosting, which is um, even during the break, we were talking about that, and you know, when it comes to hosting, really a lot of these, you know, you can pay a little or you can pay a lot, and you know, it's really apples and oranges. So, what is WordPress? First of all, I suppose a good question is, who already has a website? Okay, so the vast majority of everyone here, who has a WordPress website? Okay, good, that's fantastic. Um, how about WordPress.com? Anyone WordPress.com users? Okay, a couple. That's good. And obviously the rest of WordPress.org, which is good. So here's a, some data I've got. Um, these walls and text, because the slides will be online, so I want to give everyone a bit of context. Um, but essentially, WordPress started off as a blogging platform. Uh, people usually refer to it as a blogging platform, but really it um, came of age as a, a content management system. So people are using WordPress for all sorts of things. And over the last couple of years, it's actually evolved into more of a platform. So people are actually developing software that runs on WordPress to do lots of different things for different um, industries and different cases. But it's, it's a, as I mentioned during the break to somebody, um, it's a killer publishing platform. So if uh, you know the vast majority of websites, you know WordPress just fits and ticks all the boxes. Um, but it's it's you know it's been around for a while. Um, and I think it's gained a lot of popularity because it is um, open source and has some quite uh, sort of solid um, foundations in sharing and community. And I think that's another thing that's why you see such an active, um, healthy meetup because people sort of you know love you know sharing and learning. And part of the thing you find that a lot of the developers um, who are here tonight and at the developer meetup. They're more than happy to, if they're working on some code, to give you a copy. Um, they're sort of not sort of any of this sort of silo stuff. So it's a very um, sort of healthy community. Um, used by millions of sites. Um, got some stats on the next slide. But yes, you've got you know hundreds of people working on it. We're lucky in Melbourne to have quite a few uh, people that come along to this meetup who have contributed. Um, some that are in the room tonight as well. So the people that you're kind of surrounded with, um, the people you either know. So. We, we're lucky. So here are the com competitors, and there are a few others. You might have heard things like um, Ghost and another blogging platform. There's tons of them, and there's some here that I wouldn't recommend, but I'm putting them all up here just so you know the space. Um, I work a little bit with Drupal and, and Joomla, uh, but mostly sort of mo uh, moving to WordPress. Um, so I tend to not specialise in WordPress. It just so happens that. That's the sort of vast majority of projects that I happen to work with. Um, you know, Wix and Weebly, I mean, Wix has started advertising, you know, big push. 
a lot of these are, are good systems, but what they don't have is uh, the active community and it's the, the sort of, I don't know how to put it, the sort of the vibe of the community that something like WordPress has. And there is a Joomla and a Drupal uh, group in Melbourne as well. So if you, you know, I always like keeping up to date with what's out there. But WordPress here, as you can see, this is from a site called um, Built With. They have a trends uh, section. Now it's, you know, a bit hit and miss, and it's, they've taken it from identifiable sites, which is, you know, not every single site. But you can see there that, you know, the vast majority of identifiable content management systems are WordPress. So, from a popularity point of view, we've got a couple of things here. You've got, you know, people, which is a forum, and you've got, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of other things, Blogger. It's pretty popular. So, how do I get WordPress? And that's sort of the question. Mm -hmm. How do I get it? I wanted to get WordPress. Well, there are two flavors, as I've mentioned. .com and .org, usually people um, uh, refer to it. And you might also hear people talk about self-hosted WordPress. So I've got my own hosting, self-hosted. Um, whereas WordPress.com, it sits, someone else manages that. So we'll cover WordPress.com first. And if there's any questions along the way, please just shout out. Okay, more than happy to sort of stop and, and answer questions. That's what WordPress.com looks like. It's incredibly easy. I remember I timed myself how quick I could actually sign up on the mobile client on a phone. You can do it. It's, it's seconds. You can sign up, put your email address in, the uh, handle that you're going to have something.wordpress.com, verify the email, and you're up and running. And it's free um, for somebody that uh, just wants to get started and uh, start blogging or um, you know just dabble. This is a good way. And a lot of the functionality of WordPress.com is the same as the .org version, but there are some differences. So you can see here's a sample slide. Um, there's some ads. So obviously, if you're a business, you probably don't want your competitors' ads displaying on your page because, as you can see, it kind of looks like that's a part of the site. Um, okay, so it's run by Automatic, who is the company that, um, that really started by the founder of WordPress. Um, it's a shared platform. So it runs, I don't know what the number is, anybody know the number of sites on WordPress.com, but it's super huge. Okay, there you go. So just, just a few million or so. So that, that's a big number. So it's um, very popular. Um, I've you know, worked on a lot. I think it's safe to say that most people that work, work with a lot of WordPress are working on the self-hosted version. But it's good to know what the comparisons are. So it sort of demystifies things a bit. Um, and it's the same, mostly the same software that you actually download for the self-hosted version. There's a whole lot of similarities, a lot of the sort of the core is, is the same. Um, so it's great for people new to websites. So I uh, usually, if somebody's really kind of you know scared of taking that first step, I'll say jump on WordPress.com, um, start a blog, and if they like it, I usually they sort of say, oh, my own site, my own hosting, and we take the next step. Um, so it's also worth knowing that you can upgrade the WordPress.com to get rid of the ads and change the themes and that kind of thing. And I'll do a little bit of comparison, but so I'm doing apples and apples, I'm comparing the free version of WordPress.com um, versus the self-hosted. So roughly, there's the prices, so free, you know, and it's good, you know, may show some ads, community support, whereas if you're prepared to pay, um, you can start to do more. But there are some limitations, and you, um, who's heard of the term plugins, WordPress plugins? Yeah. Okay, good. So it's so about half the room. Um, I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit, but WordPress plugins is, I think, one of the most sort of important things. And if you look at software traditionally, um, most of the successful software that are applications or platforms were built with some type of um, ability to extend. So whether it be you know, extensions or plugins or add-ons, and I think WordPress has enabled it with you know, be able to extend functionality by plugins, and there are heaps of them. I've got this random slide in because I thought one thing that I do get from people who usually have a vested interest in selling a proprietary content management system or platform is they say WordPress is a blog, it doesn't scale. Um, that seems to do all right for these guys. Now this hosting is extremely, uh, costs a lot of money, it's really expensive, but it's um, basically you get around the clock management by very skilled people and some of the, the world's biggest sites run on WordPress. 
So if somebody tells you that you know I've got a busy site, it won't run on WordPress, um, they probably haven't spoken to the people that, that come along to the meetup, some of the people that are um, in the audience tonight. But you can run some very large sites. There, is, there aren't any issues on scaling WordPress. And vip.wordpress.com is, is usually a good example to, if you're interested in sort of high performance um, WordPress. Obviously, it's a little bit different, so you have to tweak it a little bit, which is why you know, there's things you can do to the server, things you can do to the WordPress install itself to make it um, more able to handle more visitors, but you can definitely do it. Uh, so what is WordPress.org? This is what it looks, the site looks like. Um, you've got a little button there that says download WordPress, and it gives you a zip file or a gzip file. Um, but essentially what it is, it looks like that. When you unzip the file, you get a bunch of PHP and some uh, style sheets and some other bits and pieces. And really, the way to think of this, don't have to be overwhelmed with this, these are the files that you copy or that are installed on your web host. And it's a, it's, a, it's a software application. Your server knows what to do and serve that as uh, an application. So really, it's um, you know when you sort of think about, oh, I don't want to upload files, and it's, you know it could be daunting if you're not used to doing it. But there are other ways to install, and we're actually going to dedicate um, a future session on installing the right way, because you might have heard of one-click installs, which just puts it there. That's, that's fine, but there's also things you can do to try and make your WordPress installation a bit more secure and optimised, and we're going to be covering that at a future session. So, here are some of the main points for WordPress.org. Um, you need a domain name. You don't actually really need a domain name, but you most 90% of the time you'd want a domain name. Um, and hosting. Now, you could download WordPress and put it on your local computer. You don't have to have, um, you know, have it on a public server, but that's what you, most people want a website, they want it on the, on the public internet. So you want a domain name and hosting. You also have the ability to use free and pay plugins, which again extends functionality or, or gives WordPress extra uh, functionality, and also themes. So themes determine the look and feel of the site. They're two very different things, and if you're interested in those topics, for example, customising the look and feel of the site, come along to the developer meetup, that's where you really get stuck into those topics. Um, so, for example, some plugins could be um, a contact form plugin, so something that you know gathers details or leads, um, you know Facebook Connect or you know Google Plus uh, commenting. These are sorts of things that would be <coughs> sort of plugin. So they're sort of user-facing plugins. You also have functionality in the back end, so things that speed your site up, caching plugins or security plugins or backup plugins. So. It's, it's a great thing, and I always kind of say, you know, plugins are great, but don't go off and install a whole heap of them because it can also slow your site down. And some of them, there's varying qualities of plugins. So that's why we'll be covering in future months how to identify a good plugin. And usually, the sort of tip is, is it actively developed? Has a lot, have a lot of people, um, you know, downloaded it and reviewed it positively? Um, you may need some technical knowledge or help. But you're here, so you're halfway there. You're in the right place. You are responsible for backups, upgrades, and security of the site. That's an important thing to mention. You don't just want to install something and think it's going to, um, you know, the spammers and the, you know, the hackers and crackers won't sort of uh, have a go. It's all automated these days, so you need to make sure your site's locked down. But your web hosting company usually helps with these things. So most hosting companies offer daily backups or at least some type of backup option. But again. Um, not to, you've come to the right place. We're going to cover things like backing up and security at future meetings. So, typical pricing, and this is obviously this is a starting point. Uh, Ten dollars a year for a domain name with a uh, .au use, it's uh, two year minimum, and about a hundred dollar for a basic uh, website hosting package. Now you can pay a lot more, and if, you, if your business revolves around uh, you know, transactions online, or if your website is very critical to your business, you would be looking at something that has probably better reliability or, or um, you know, options that can help keep you going if there are problems. Same as, uh, you know, I'd say that anything cheaper than that, I think that'd probably be a catch. And uh, usually what I say is that's probably what I'd start at. Expect to pay a bit more if you want really uh, fast servers that are located in Australia. 
Um, and that's, again, something that I'll give you some references when we cover hosting. Uh, so yeah, you can learn to do all this stuff, and uh, you know, we talk about it at the meetups quite often. Um, you can allocate time to learn, or you can also pay people to help with that. So which one should you use? Now, the fact that this is the sort of logo for the .org version, there's nothing really, uh, thing, but I think most people do, um, who work with WordPress a lot, work with the self-hosted version, because there are, there are limitations to the, to the hosted version. So, really, um, this is sort of my best summary that I could kind of put together. For beginners, people on a very limited budget, I mean, who don't want to spend $5, that's that limited. Um, and hobbyists, okay, so they don't really want to get into the whole web thing, they're happy just to jump online and just quickly publish the content. If you've got a business, if you want uh, functionality, if you've got applications or you want to build a community, um, definitely uh, .org will give you the, um, the, the features you need. So the free versions, limited, um, you get a free WordPress domain, so it's blah 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 dot wordpress dot com. Um, they look after all the updates, so it is, there are some pros there. Um, and you can get paid upgrades available. Free to download, but you pay for the domain name hosting now. But most people already have an existing website. They've already got hosting, and they've already got their domain name. So really, it's just, you know, a lot of um, upgrades are just installing WordPress, and, you know, quite often, it's easier to install a fresh WordPress install than it is to modify someone's old website. I don't know if anyone finds that, but usually that's the, you sort of look at something and you, you know, it's an older, horrible system where you just copy and paste the content in a new site, especially for a site that hasn't got a lot of complexity. Okay, so easy to set up and maintain, harder to set up and maintain, but I've got, although not that hard, especially if you come along to these meetups, and as I say again, you're halfway there if you're here. Um, need access to your server, it's things like cPanel, which are sort of web-based con uh, control panels to actually set up things. If you've got your own website, you probably got this, and you probably set up things like email addresses, etc. through this. Um, and also, some hosting providers offer a one-click install if things like FTP or, um, you know, if that sort of scares you, but we are going to cover that in coming months. So, generally speaking, a free account is seen, not seen as professional. It's kind of like someone, you know, blah blah blah, 22 at hotmail.com. It's not as professional as, you know, your own domain name. Kind of the same thing when you're talking about you know, subdomain, you know, example.wordpress.com. Sure, there are some upgrades, but, uh, you know, you still have limitations. You've got complete control of how your website appears if you have your own self-hosted uh, version, no ads, and I've got this underlined for emphasis that you have complete control, and, you know, I get excited about not just extending, but also integrating with other business systems or, or other platforms that are out there, and that's really the power of the web. It's linking things together, it's, you know, creating, uh, you know, interesting things. Harder to modify, can't modify the source code or use plugins, and also there's a restriction on themes. So, you can't sort of buy a theme, even though you can purchase it, you can't sort of move it if you decide to upgrade down the track. Um, with the self-hosted, you can modify the code, which, when you start getting into more advanced things, you need to do. Um, you can also, if you're, you know, creative or, um, want to, you can start changing your own, um, changing your theme to give you a unique look and feel, and you can also use plugins. So I've got, again, plugins are sort of really where it's at, just don't go overboard, look at what you kind of need, and get advice from people in the room on, uh, you know, should I install this, is this the best one? So really it comes down to what your needs are. If you're just starting out, there's nothing wrong with WordPress.com. Some people go, oh, it's WordPress.com, forget about it. It's used by... 35 million people, so you know, maybe they're not all them active, but it's quite popular. So that sums up, oops, that sort of covers that. For more help, there's a forum, there's also documentation, and uh, by one of the guys at the back, um, Anthony's written, um, I think it's nearly at 100,000 downloads. It's close. 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 Um, it's called Easy WP Guide, and it's the most popular WordPress manual there is. Um, it's one that I, I give to everyone that um, I work with to help get them started. You, you learn um, the ins and outs of the user interface and what you can do with WordPress. So I highly recommend that it's free. Okay, so any questions about the two, the two differences at this point? Um, can you talk about the 
can you mention something about something I saw last year, and a friend of mine in the US actually has it, where he hasn't got self-hosted, but I think he had to pay $18 or something US to not have WordPress dot com as part of his domain, he just has his own whatever it is yep. dot com. Yep, so what what that uh, sounds like they've done. Sorry to go back, but I'll show you. That's probably what, what they've done. So that's per year, so maybe it's a monthly billing or something similar. This is, sounds like probably what they've done. So you can upgrade. It was only $18 per year. Okay. It it could also have been a you can just get a domain name per year. Just the domain name. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's not. Yeah. So there's still a link on the footer and the ads, which you have to upgrade to. But the domain name, yes, correct. He hasn't got self-hosting. He's just no. got the domain name. Yep. All oh, right. Then that's what that is. Correct. Yeah. Right. But there's still limitations. So I, I yes. usually say if you're sort of outgrowing the .com, jump on the dollar. <laughs> not sure if that's uh, you know, everybody's sort of got their own preferences, but that's sort of my take on it. He's happy with his. Yeah, yeah, well, that, look, it's good. Yeah. That's good. Um, okay, so domain names and hosting. So, Jargon Buster. So, this is to help people that um, are still sort of, you know, learning some of the terms. Um, I think this kind of helps. And, um, you know, I'll just sort of cover a few quick terms. Um, HTTP. So, these are the terms that your web developer might use, or, um, you know, the company that you're currently dealing with might use some of these terms to try and intimidate you. But really, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, no, that's the protocol, HTTP, you're used to seeing it at the front of an address, that, that's the language that the web browser talks to the server. Um, World Wide Web, everyone knows what that is. Um, URL, that's the address, so that's your, you know, blah.com, or it could be blah.com slash file.zip. Um, web server, so that's really nothing, it's very similar to your computer that you've got, except it sits in a data center with multiple power supplies and multiple connections to the internet, and usually they're bigger. And that's where your files that we showed you the, the unzipped WordPress, you upload them to the web server, and when someone's looking for your site, all the magic happens. Your web browser, hopefully everyone's using something like Chrome or, or Firefox, um, that's a, the software that you use to view web pages. And I've got HTML somewhere, and you know, web pages are really made up of HTML, CSS, images, maybe some JavaScript. Um, your browser sort of makes sense of all that and pulls it together. Um, ISP, it's what you connect to the internet with. So that's a little bit different. Sometimes hosting and ISP gets, gets confused. Um, a registrar and registry, they're, they're sort of, they're very different. The domain registrar is who you register your domain through. Domain registry in Australia, Oz Registry, is the main central, company, well, central database where all the domains are stored. So the one sort of um, authority on, on who owns what domain and what it points to. Uh, Cover those, PHP, um, IP address, that's another thing that you might see. That everything that you've got when we're talking about domain names, the domain name translates a human readable blah 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 com into an IP address. So everything's still talking via IP address. It's just the domain names help us uh, mask that using human readable formats. Um, the domain name, example.com.au, which will cover some other extensions. Um, your web host, and we talked about web, uh, web hosting. And a content management system, a CMS, especially in the world of WordPress, everyone's like, WordPress is CMS, CMS, you hear that all the time. That, that's true, used as a content management system, there's lots of them. Um, you know, they're some of the, the, the sort of main terms that you might come across. So this is an analogy, it's a, it's a simple one, but it's handy if, you, if you're starting out. Think of this as, you know, the internet, I always say the information super highway. Um, domain name is your address where people can find you, and obviously you can change addresses, you can also change your house, you can change your land, it doesn't sort of work exactly translated as well as that, but, um, but your website is your house, and your hosting is a land. It's a simplified version, but if it helps to sort of explain what that means. Domain names, okay. So this is, that's what a domain name looks like. And it does make a difference, it's, it's worth getting a good domain name and getting some background on, um, you know, for your project or your business, getting the right name can actually make or break it. So for, um, you know, especially online businesses or sort of internet-based startups, they do focus a lot on their, you know, branding and getting the right uh, domain name. And in Australia, we tend to use .com.au. But as you can see, there's lots of others. 
and if you're a non-profit organisation or an association, government department or an educational institution, you might have something else. But for most businesses within Australia, if your customers are within Australia, .com.au is usually what you want. Uh, you've also probably seen things like you know, .io, which is sort of seem to be you know, sort of trendy with the kind of startup sort of scene. You might have seen .tv, and soon you're going to get .anything. So they're introducing uh, new extensions where people can have .book or .app or you know, .amazon, and there's sort of disputes on who's entitled to .amazon, for example. So there's interesting things happening in the domain name space. There's some examples of some sales. So this is on um, one of the sites that I helped help run. Um, it maintains a list of .au sales. Just to give you an idea now, you know, as you can see, for something that has a very competitive uh, sort of keyword reach or brandable name, you know, there's some pretty good prices. So I've got some tips if you're selecting a domain name, what to think about. Definitely the shorter the better, because people are typing this in, or if they are typing this in. Um, but most importantly, a clear business use, something that's obscure. Uh, you know, I, I come across a lot of you know sites and a lot of domains. Something that's easy to spell. You don't want to be having somebody thinking, what? What? How do you spell that? So if you if you've already got an existing business name, you might have the choice of just plucking out some other domain name. But if you are starting a new project or working with your clients on choosing a domain name. Um, you know, make sure that things like easy to remember. If someone go home and be able to type that in, or if they hear it on the radio, will they know how to spell it? So quite often, you know, if I say go to everyone go to nikki.com.au, you might say well, is it with a CK or is it with a KI? That's an example. Um, and I've got usually try and avoid, but no, if you can avoid numbers and hyphens, that's also pretty pretty important. Um, unique, and I think that's another thing. So when you're thinking about a brand, ideally. When you're building a service, you're not wanting to sort of chase sort of some keyword, you know, budget removals, you know, Melbourne CBD .net .au. You'd like something that's brandable. You've got to build a brand, so think about something that's unique, that's very different to your competitors. Um, and generally, again, it comes back down to, especially when we're talking about hosting, it's the same deal. If you've got international customers, um, you might want an international profile, but if you've got Australian customers, um, .au seems to be the most common. So obviously, check if it's available. So a lot of people start getting logos and saying, this is what I'm going to do, and then realise that the site, there might not be a site there, but someone's actually registered the domain. And I think that, you know, the sort of sad fact is a lot of the good domain names have been registered a long time ago. And, you know, check out, I've got some places you can buy, you know, decent domain names, it might cost you, but if, you're, if you've got a web project that you're going to spend time and energy building and with on design or on marketing, you know, dedicating a fraction of that to just getting a good domain name is, I think, you know, shows that you're kind of serious and you've got some resources to, to do it seriously. Um, but registrations, that's about roughly how much you should pay. There's a couple of other sort of specialist, um, these specialist registrars who help people manage larger uh, numbers of domains. But it's $20 for two years, roughly, of what you expect to pay. And also be careful of the fake renewals that you get in the mail. Quite often, um, you know, if you've got your details online, people will send out fake renewals. They're not real renewals. And the fine print it says, this renewal means you're transferring to us, and you're paying them $180 for what should cost $20, essentially. Um, the marketplace is where you can get some Australian names. Netflix is probably the most well-known. Uh, fabulous domains, Flipper. Um, there's a couple of other, D-Trade, Attractive where you can get names. And I've purchased a couple for projects, um, paid uh, reasonable amounts for, but personally for online projects, I think it's worth worth doing. And when I say reasonable, you know, you could spend a couple hundred dollars if you've got, say, a um, landscape gardening business, getting a good domain name that actually suits rather than settling for something that might not be as good. Um, I won't go through all of this, but I would say if you're registering a domain name, um, Outer, who's the sort of governing body for .au, has a list of accredited registrars. Go through one of those. Um, you need an ABN, that's another thing that you need. And yeah, no less restrictions for getting a .com or net than there is an AU. You yeah, have to have an AU. So, it's not currently registered, $10 a year, currently registered a couple of options. Choose a different extension, which uh, people are starting to do. And that's why I think you know people favour, you might have seen .co or 
you know, a .NET or something else. You don't have to pay you know, a lot of money for somebody. And I think if you contact somebody and say, I really want to buy this domain name, and they say, well, I want you know, a million dollars for it, there's nothing wrong if you're going back saying, look, my budget's this, is this, you know, I'd be prepared to pay this. Now, they might say no, or go away, but at least you've given it a shot. Um, quite often, uh, I've seen, you know, domain names that people have huge telephone number figures, and I've said, look, I'll pay $500 for it, and they've said done. So it, it's, you have to think about it like that. And if it's worth that to you to get uh, to build your brand, then why not? Okay, so more help on domains. There's a couple of a couple of websites. Hosting. Is there any questions about domain names at this point? Yes. Can I just ask? Sure. If you go on and look for the domain name and it's a particular one you really want and it's still available, you go back the next day and it's no longer available. Okay. You try to log into the site and it doesn't exist. Okay. I have to probably like give some examples because there's ways you can actually I'm see the history. I'm convinced there's somebody out there sitting, oh, looking to see who's looking at them, and grabbing them and holding on to them uh, until they can sell them for more. There's, there's, there was a, a very popular case where one of the company had something that what they would do is, and it's easy to test that because you just put in something that's unique and then see if it's registered. And, and that the company that was doing it very popular was caught out very early on. But a lot of the things, the tools that um, you know generate, I think it's called, uh, I might post it on, on Meetup later, but there's, there's sites that will generate sort of you know funky words or brandable words or they'll sort of take, you know, they'll give something L-Y on the end. <coughs> so you don't, you can come up with something creative and that's... The one yeah. I was specifically wanting... They registered, yeah. ...is still not available on the internet. It's no longer available when, when I go into the okay. place. And if I put www.lifemagician.com, yep. it doesn't exist. Okay. And you can't get it. I'll, I'll have a look if you want after the sessions. I'll, I'll have a look at the history to see if anyone owns it or who owns it or if it's ever been owned. You can, you can tell that. I'm not sure if I still want it. I've now got no, another one, but it's really annoyed me that I can't like get myself, it. Like myself, I've got two and I haven't yeah. booked my business yet. There you go. I've got yeah. the name and I'm holding on to it until I'm ready. Well, a common question is, if, is using a domain something that, you know, is a person entitled to have it? And you hear people sort of, you know, giving an analogy of real estate. If you bought sort of waterfront you know, property, should you have to develop it? Well, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's, you know, a hot topic of, of discussion. And, um, but I think there are a lot of people that invest in domain names. They sort of see that just like they invest in websites or apps, those sorts of things. So if you look at something like, you know, Clipper, they sell a lot of, act, you know, active websites and, um, you know, it's, it's a commodity. Yeah. So hosting. So hosting is, you know, another sort of, you know, a lot of religious sort of debates on hosting. Um, and a few, few of these slides. <laughs> because everyone's got an opinion, it's kind of like, you know, I like Holden or I don't like Ford or, you know, I like sort of Toyota. Everyone's got a different opinion, and my, I, I, I know a lot of people work in hosting companies, and you know I love them all, but they can all also suck all of them. Um, it just it depends because what you're doing is it's the nature of what they're providing. It's technology, um, you know. As we know, we all back up our stuff because we've all been bitten by losing work and unreliable technology. So take this with a grain of salt, but I think the, the sort of the main thing is. You know, do your research, talk to people in at meetups like this, and you will get um, a good idea of who's who's really, really bad, and then you'll stay away from them, and you're doing better than most if you do that. So what's the difference? Why do we have to, to care about this stuff? Um, if you want a fast site, you need to care about this stuff. If you don't want to pay a lot of money and want a fast site, you need to care about this stuff. So server location, Australian versus international. Again, it comes back down to where is your audience? Um, or your budget as well. US hosting is very cheap, so if you have a limited budget, that's fine. But generally speaking, if you want, you know, really fast site, pay for some local hosting. We, we saw that it starts about 100 a year, which for a web, if it's your business, it's worth uh, investing in. What sort of features do you get? Things like storage space, you know, if you've got lots of photos, uh, bandwidth, how many email addresses, how many domains can you have? Can I have subdomains? These are all things that, you know, usually when you start comparing them, None of them mesh where you can compare apples and apples. You're always looking at, some will give you unlimited this, but then this, you know, for an SSL certificate, they charge you $150. Whereas some, you know, charge you $50 for the SSL certificate, but charge you more for a dedicated IP address. So, 
you know, do your shopping around. What I would say is I would go by whoever you have feedback, personal feedback of good support. Good customer support, good customer service, I think is probably one of the, the number one things that I would look for. Um, what do they provide? Tip, test them out. Tech support, ask them, you know, do you allow uh, us, you know, SSL certificates? So how much does this cost? If you get a response pretty quickly, hopefully you don't get it from the sales team, which usually always answer quickly. Even before the confirmation email is sent back, they'll reply to you. But um, come to, if you have meetups like this, ask people. Ask, you know, your, your fellow, uh, you know, your peers, who do they use and who would you recommend them? Um, I tend to have an account with most of them. Um, and like I said, I found good and bad in pretty much all of them. Check out the customer reviews. Um, hopefully they're not marketing people, but <coughs> I've got a couple of uh, places that I recommend looking. And also Linux Unix. Not that there's anything wrong with Windows, but uh, yeah. So here's a few. I know that there's going to be people in the audience that are going to go, what, he's got them there, <laughs> which I can already see it. But these tend to be, tend to get either, you know, good feedback to some of these. And uh, there's, there's a few that I sort of left off here that, um, you know, you've got the cheaper, and then you've got, you know, like these guys, Bulletproof, Anchor, they specialise in way more sort of high performance, but you pay for that. So a lot of small to medium businesses, that's sort of out of their budget, although they do sort of offer uh, sort of starting out packages. Then you've got, you know, GoDaddy, HostGator, um, you know, your mileage will vary. I've also got these guys at the top here. These are dedicated WordPress hosts. So they, all they do is they just specialise in just hosting WordPress. So if you don't need other things and you just want a WordPress site, they're, they're sort of worth a look. And I recommend talking to people and asking, who do you use? Is it crazy this thing, all these guys? And maybe. But again, I don't find anyone that's got, you know, um, perfect track record. The more you kind of dig, and I've got a link down the bottom here on my blog called Australian Web Hosting Providers. Basically what that was, I was at a, an industry event where I asked a whole bunch of people, who do you recommend, who do you use? And it's interesting because one person would say, I use A, and they'd say, never use A. So your mileage will vary. But generally speaking, as long as you stay away from the really bad stuff and you're not paying too much for it, that's the main thing. But there's things we can do, okay? So really bad hosting, you can monitor. And I've got this as a bit of a tip. Um, there's a site, there's lots of these different services out there. The Pingdom's one. And if you go there, I've got the screenshot because, you know, you think, what's, what's he talking about? Go to Pingdom, it's $10 a month. I don't really want to pay 10 a month. But right down the bottom here, they've got this little thing that says the free plan. So if you've got one site and it's good at detecting stuff like this. So this is from a client site. They said, I, I could tell, I was looking at the analytics, I could tell they had problems. They said, no, no, I'm paying a lot, it's, it's good hosting. It's, I said, it's in, not, it doesn't look that great to me because I could tell there's a problem. So I just um, set them up with this, uh, two and a half, nearly two and a half hours of downtime. Don't look at it if it's a minute or two because a lot of these monitoring uh, systems are based in the US, they're monitoring Australian servers. But generally speaking, if you've got any big, large periods of downtime, it will not be uh, good. It wouldn't be good for your business, it wouldn't be good from uh, a search engine point of view either. So Pingdom, that's a little bit of a tip. But for more uh, interesting stuff, there's a dedicated forum that web hosting uh, people and companies use, um, and also Whirlpool and Dan Trade have separate threads on hosting. Um, and again, if you look at them, you'll say, never use this registrar, or never use this hosting company, and you kind of back to the sort of holding and forth there. So just to recap, what are your questions, sorry, about hosting? Does anybody have any good experiences or bad experiences? Bad experience? Yeah. Um, two client sites hacked before we even built the site. Yep. And that's with um, Crazy Domains, with their cheap hosting yep. um, called Sierra Host. Yep. Yep. Anyway, so that's the same. yep. So that's... Um, it was a server side hack, so the server was hacked. A lot of time people think that the hosts, the web hosting company is looking after all this stuff, and sometimes they do. So there's one one of the, the um, providers, there are a couple of providers, they do a bit of proactive stuff, so they'll actually shut the site down, and sometimes it's when I'm sending out like a, gen, a, a, you know, a legitimate um, you know, bulk email, and then they'll, I'll have to sort of say, no, no, I was actually meant to do that, and those sorts of things. So a good host has usually good staff that they keep happy and motivated, and um, that makes a difference, and that's why I think support is always a good issue. It's not just first level, but also senior people as well. Um, so that's good. That's a good bit of feedback. Oh, 
pretty much everyone there, I've got a, some sort of account. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I use Quadra hosting for that one, and that, that company down there. But I must say, I've been impressed with quite a few on at least. It really depends on what your budget is, and I would compare and, and jump on the phone and talk to them because you want to be able to have something if, if you know if something goes wrong, if you rely on your website for your business, you want that support. You want that level of support. Can I say uh, also from experience, get in writing that they can host the WordPress site. I had a client who went to a WordPress site, he was hosted by Telstra Big Farm. Yep. And he's on their old server and they told us and him over the phone that they could host it and they sort of get there and they, no. Okay. They had to move him. They, it was uh, it was an old old server that they had him on. They yeah. had to move him over to the new Telstra servers. They just let him lie and were still charging him five hundred dollars a year or something yeah. for this old thing. I mean, there's there's even worse horror stories than that. Yeah. And I think you know the, the classic thing is the real cheap cheap hosting. And I, I know I've had a lot of people say, "I'm not going to pay you know X hundred a month or you know X thousand a year." But this is for companies that are making a lot of money from their website because I can get it for five dollars a month and. You know, but the problem is you can't upload, you can't import content, you can't run certain plugins, there's limitations. So usually it's sort of basic resources, so how much RAM, how much disk space, um, how much bandwidth. So kind of you pay for what you get, but always sort of talk to people that, um, that, that, that do this sort of stuff. And you know, there's, there's tons of people in this room that, um, you know, collective full of knowledge. Um, so we've covered what WordPress is, what WordPress.com is all, the difference between two, and it really depends on your needs. Um, some tips for choosing a domain name, um, and also some tips on choosing a good hosting provider. So, want more? As I said before, the following months we'll be building on, on these topics to get more into installing um, themes, plugins, those sorts of topics. So, as I said a few times, you're in the right spot. But get yourself onto the meetups. And I've got this slide, you might think you're probably here. What's, this guy's crazy, but um, the slides are going to be online, so if everyone that didn't come along, hopefully this sort of makes them. Uh, come to the next one. <coughs> Questions? And that's it. <laughs> so any questions? I'll be around afterwards if anyone would like to um, have a chat and hope to see you the next one. I've got one. I post a number of WordPress sites on GoDaddy. Yep. Um, I've got access to some web infrastructure. How hard is it to set up, I guess, WordPress hosting on a web server and does it take a lot to maintain that from a sysadmin point of view? Um, I think it's, it's just knowing the, the right ways to do it and the right techniques and, and definitely I know that uh, you know, we were talking about perhaps installing and we might talk a little bit about importing or migrating. Um, it's, it's pretty easy. You'd be surprised how the wealth of information that's out there. I mean there's almost a video for nearly you know, anything that you can do with WordPress on YouTube for example. So yeah. I would say if you're the sort of person that sounds like you are that you know doesn't mind sort of doing a bit of the grunt work yourself. Plenty of resources. Okay, cool. And and good, you know, friendly people to help. Yeah. Well. Thanks. Oh, cool. Thanks everyone. Uh, thanks, Chris. And then start talking to you later. I'm not that boring, am I? <laughs> Okay, so I saw from Chris's presentation that the majority of people here are already running uh, WordPress websites, or mostly WordPress, but running websites. How many of you actually took the time to plan your website before you could go online? Okay, so about half. And how many of you actually have an intention of making money from your site? Less than I thought. For those that don't intend making money from your site, how many are actually planning to like grow an audience? Is that your intention? Yeah, okay, so that's basically the risk. So one way or another, you're trying to get something out of your website. You're either trying to make money or you're trying to get traffic. Which, you know, again, if you're not planning it, then you're not going to get that result either. Okay, so I know planning is not the sexiest of topics, so I'll try and keep this brief, and I'll try and keep it pretty high level. Um, but it is a very, very important topic because if you get it wrong, or worse still, you don't do it, um, then your website's not going to give you the results you want. 
And the other point to, that I just want to get across here is sometimes you know, we're all in a rush to get our sites light, to get out there, and get, you know, start, start getting our information out. Um, the problem is, if you rush too much, and you head down a path and you change direction, change again, you end up with band-aids on band-aids, and it can actually take a lot to unwind that and get the site you really need. So sometimes the fastest way to succeed is to actually just slow down, take a breath, have a think, get all your ducks in a row, and then just make that happen. A little planning can make a huge difference to the end result, and it can actually cut down the time it takes you to get your website live. Uh, I know it's counterintuitive, but trust me, I've done it. <laughs> um, another one that we all hear, uh, you know, I don't think there's anyone in this room that hasn't heard this before, failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, and yet we're still rushing. <laughs> Okay, so what do we mean by planning your site? So there's a few components that I think of when I start thinking about planning a site. The first and probably the biggest one is, who is it that we're actually targeting? What, why are we creating a site? Who are we creating for? So we, we can think about that in terms of demographics. You know, are we targeting women? Are we targeting men? Are we targeting 25 to 35? Or are we targeting, targeting the, uh, you know, the team market? Or you know, who is it that we're actually targeting? Um, and there's, you know, there's a number of ways that we can look at this. We can do the broad brush, you know, 25 to 35 year old female executive or something like that. Or, one that I found even more powerful is, is an exercise called the one person. So you actually sit down and you write the life story of the person that you are targeting. So, you know, this is Jane, she's uh, working in this job, she's this old, she's got two kids, she's etc, etc. And you, you even go to the extent of getting out a stock image and putting a picture up. And you put that picture up next to your, your computer whenever you're working, and that's the person you're talking to. Just helps you get very, very specific about, okay, well, if that's Jane, how do I reach Jane? Okay, so you might want to try that next time rather than just that broad brush demographics. Um, the other thing you, you might want to look at is, okay, so if that's who I'm targeting, what else are they interested in? You know, what sports do they do? What interests do they have? Who do they hang out with? Um, Another big question is, you know, who has my customer before I do? So your, your people that you're wanting to get in front of, they're already using other products and services. If you can identify who they might be, then that'll help you, one, you know, put, put your site up in a way that they're going to be attracted to it. Two, it'll also help you identify who you should be talking to to help you get your audience uh, coming to you as well. So you might be able to create strategic alliances or partnerships or something identify who else is talking to your customer. Um, which is that one there. Who else serves it? Is there complementary services that they're already using or is there something that's totally unrelated to what you're doing but just that sort of person would be interested in that sort of service or product? Uh, you know, do they, do they shop at trendy clothes stores or do they go to the op shop or whatever it is, you know, if you think hard enough, there's a lot of things we can identify about our customer that are going to help us design a site for them and reach them. And as I said, the more specific you get, the more it's going to help you when you're going through A, designing the site and B, writing content. Okay, so it's not a matter of do this once and dismiss it, it's like that's, you keep it there the whole time you put the site live, every time you put something up, speak to that person. It doesn't mean you're excluding everyone else, but it helps you get very specific about who it is you're talking to, and they'll just, they'll feel like you're talking to them, and, and there'll be thousands of people that feel like you're talking to them. So the big, big takeaway here, I guess, is that knowing your target audience will help you build a site that is um, tailored to their needs. So when we build a site, it's not about building for us, or at least it's not if we're trying to get uh, an audience or we're trying to, to make money from it. Now, it might be a great ego boost to say, oh, there's the site I love sort of thing, but if you're trying to do something with that site, in terms of reaching and influencing people, you need to build it for them, okay? That's the big takeaway. So the next thing we need to think about when we're planning is, is the content. You know, what content, what are we doing? So we need to think about the type of content we're going to have on our site. You know, is it going to be mainly text, you know, blog articles, uh, information pieces, maybe some PDF downloads or things like that. Um, are we going to have an image heavy site? You know, is it a sunny set a day for 365 days type of site? You know? uh, maybe it's a photography site. 
Um, are we going to do a lot of video on the site? You know, video tutorials or you know, any sort of videos, I guess. Um, are we going to have podcasts or, or other audio content on the site? The other thing we need to think about in terms of content is you know, how often we're going to update the content. You know, how big is the amount of content going to be? Because um, if you go ahead and build a site that you know you go with a cheap host or you go with an infrastructure that's not really built for a lot of content, and then you go update it with huge files twice a day, you're pretty quickly going to break that site. So these are the sort of things you've got to keep in mind. What's, what's your growth capacity? How, how much space, how much, how much grunt are you going to need to get you through that next six to 12 months? And another thing to think about up front is, you know, is this going to be just your site or are you going to have other people contributing content to it? Because depending on the answer to that question will depend on how you set up the infrastructure of the site. You know, do you need to account for user, other user accounts? Do you need to put in place a editorial flow? Or is it just you and you don't need to worry about all that stuff? Okay? So all these questions feed into the way you set the site up. Um, it'll drive both the, the technical infrastructure, which you know, we sort of covered on the hosting. Um, it'll also drive you know, what sort of themes, what sort of plugins you use. You know, drive the way you lay out your content will drive a whole bunch of questions. Okay? So it pays to give it a bit of thought up front. And again, especially with content, pardon me, if you don't think about this up front, you think, oh yeah, I'll just throw this theme up and, and we'll start building because I like the look of it. And then you start realizing, well, hang on a second, I'm using most of the video and this one doesn't display video nice. Yeah, then you've got to back the whole thing out, redo your selection of theme, redo all your customization. So, pays to give it a bit of thought up front. The next question to consider is, you know, what type of site is it? You know, what am I doing with this site? So this is things like, is, is it just a blog? You know, is this my thoughts that I'm putting out there? I'm just trying to gather a readership of like-minded people. Um, is it a business website? You know, am I trying to promote the products and services that I have on offer? You know, am I trying to build a reputation? Um, is it a membership site? You know, I'm going to, is this something I'm going to sell to people and they're going to pay me a certain amount of money and I'm going to keep putting more content in there to, to service that uh, membership? Um, is it an e-commerce sort of site? You know, am I going to have a store like you know, Amazon? Maybe not that big, but uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe we'll build one that rivals Amazon. Yeah, it, you know, if you're thinking of selling a lot of products, that's a different setup to if you're just going to have a couple of products. You know, if you've got two or three products of your own, you do pay power buttons. If you've got you know, 50 or 60 products you're looking to offer, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> um, another sort of side is, you know, you're trying to build a community. You know, it's the sole purpose of what you're putting up here to build a community. You know, do you need something like a forum or a buddy press or, or one of those sort of uh, setups? Again, they're all just different ways of setting up the WordPress site. Um, the good thing about WordPress is it's remarkably flexible. Just say you don't, sorry, I'm very new to this, so I've got no idea. So just say I want to do all that. Yes. Is there a side of the Yes. Technically, you can do all this in one site. Would I recommend it? No. Okay. Okay. Um, the blog and the business website, definitely. You can put them on the one site. And, and certainly, if you're doing a business site, you'd be mad if you don't have a blog or a um, <laughs> Membership site, you'd probably put in, in its own installation, just from the point of view of <coughs> putting the website, the more you're going to overload it. Okay, the slower it goes, the clunkier it gets, the more chance of being hacked, all those sort of things. So, it's nice to insulate certain pieces and just put them off on the own site, but it will run as a site on its own. Yes, you end up managing your sites, um, but it's plugins and stuff that we can, uh, we'll get to further down the track that can help you manage multiple sites with one location. So don't be afraid to have multiple sites. Most of us here have probably got dozens. Yeah, so it's sort of the, the membership site, the e-commerce, the community, I would normally have them as an individual site. Have a business and blog combined. You could put the e-commerce on the business site. You know, it really depends on how big and what you intend doing, how big you intend doing. But again, just things to consider up front. The next major thing you want to think about is the look and feel. It's 
as much as we would like to think it's all about the content, I hate to say it, but it's about how your site looks. Um, how many of us have gone to a, a site that we've found on Google search and just clicked away because we either couldn't understand it or it just looked horrible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are your customers. Sorry, they're doing the same thing. Um, so like it or not, we do have to pay attention to the look and feel. So we need to think about our branding. Okay? So if we're trying to build a name for ourselves, you know, if we want the dollars to come in, if we want the followers to come in, we need to be consistent in the way we're presenting ourselves. So if they come to one part of our site and see it blue and go to another part and see green and orange or something, they're just not going to get that, oh yeah, that's the same company. So we need to be consistent, we need something that's identifiable, we need something that's memorable. We need to think about the images we're going to use on our site. So this goes beyond just the logos and whatnot, but um, you, know, you can't have a site that's just text. It's going to be very hard to read. Images make a big difference to portraying a feeling about a site. You know, carefully selected images can say more than a whole bunch of words. Okay, so think about the sort of thing you want to portray with your site and then select the images that are appropriate to that. Um, the other thing we can do is look at sample sites. So um, we all browse the web, right? We're on there more hours than we want probably per day. We know what we like, we know what we don't like. Okay, there are also places you can go specifically to see examples of the website. So, for instance, a lot of the premium theme um, sites, they have their own uh, portfolio or their showcase, so they call it. So you can go in there and have a look at what they think has been well implemented sites done on their themes. Um, and you can pick up ideas from that. You, know, you can look at how it's laid out, you can look at the colours of the views, you can look at uh, you know, what you like about those sites and what you don't like. Even within the showcases, you're going to find things that you don't like. Um, the other thing, as I said, we're building for our customer. We've got to keep that in mind too. So it's not just about what we like, it's about what they like. So once we've identified where they're hanging out, go and check those websites. You know, if you know that they're associating themselves with certain brands, have a look at the sort of sites that, that they're doing. You know, the big brands spend millions on this stuff. Look at what they've done and model some of that stuff. Because if that's reaching their customers, and that's the way you can reach them as well. So that's some good examples. Um, you can also learn a lot from bad examples. Um, so again, we've all seen them. We've seen sites that are just so shocking we've clicked away so quick. Next time you see one of those, just pause a second before you click away. Have a look at what it is that makes you not like that site. Just, just have a think about why don't you, why doesn't that site appeal to you? Is it the, the clashing colours? Is it that it's too, um, you know, too cluttered, is it? You know, what is it? And that'll give you some clues as to what to leave out of your site. Um, you can also do Google searches. You know, if you put bad website examples into a Google search, it's going to spit back sites that are specifically designed to showcase bad sites. Okay? So there's, there's both sides you can learn from. And again, I'll, I can't stress this enough. Remember that you need to consider what your target audience wants, not necessarily what you like. Okay? Unless this is purely an ego piece and you're just doing it for fun, fine, go with it. But if you're trying to reach someone and you're trying to influence them, you need to be reaching at their level. Okay? This is where planning really makes a big difference. So if we just charge off, we're going to do what we want. And we may not be our ideal customer. In a lot of cases, we're not. Okay, next thing to consider is, you know, what is your budget? Because like it or not, we all have a budget for a website, whether that's zero, whether it's thousands, there is a number. Okay, so we have to think about how much are we really prepared to pay for this site. Uh, and then we need to factor in what has to come out of that. So there's your host, uh, are you going to pay for a theme? Are you going to pay for a developer? Are you going to pay for a designer? Um, how much are you going to allow for plugins, you know? It, it all adds up. A little bit here and there, and it all adds up. So think about it up front how much you are prepared to pay. Otherwise, you'll find that you just keep shelling out and shelling out before you know it. The wallet's empty and you wonder where it's gone. The other thing we need to think about in terms of budget is how much time have we got for this? You know, is this something that has to be live next week? Or is it something we've got six months to play with? because you know, that's going to drive some of our decisions around do we do it ourselves, do we outsource it? Um, it's also going to drive decisions around you know, how hard we push and, and, and where we get things done. OK, 
Okay, so let, just be realistic about it. You know, you're not going to get uh, you know, a high level professional site up in two hours. If you show up in two hours, you won't get the, the polish in two hours. Once we've got all that in place, then we need to have a think about, well, what are our priorities? Because as much as we would like everything, it's not going to work. So to fit within our budget, within our time, we need to think about, okay, where do we draw the line? What do we absolutely have to have in the site? What can we leave for later, for later iterations? Okay? Once you're clear about that, that can help guide how you address it. And uh, for any of you who have worked in project management before, the old chestnut, time cost scope, big two. You can't have all three. Not if you want to maintain the quality. Okay? So there is a cost that's associated with everything, and it's all about just thinking about what's important to you, what are you going to allow to slide, versus what do you absolutely have to maintain. Okay? Once we've done all that, then the fun starts. We can actually start pulling it all together and actually creating our website. So to get to this point, you know, it could take you a few hours if you're prepared to sit down and actually think through it all. It could take you days, it could take you weeks. Okay, it all depends on how much time, again, in terms of your budget. It all depends on how much you want to go into the, the ideal customer research. You, know, you can get carried away with it. I would normally suggest, you know, if you can set aside a day, you'll have that day. Okay? And that day will probably save you weeks in terms of developing your site. Okay, so when we start bringing it together, uh, first step is select appropriate hosting, as Chris has already been through. Um, so you, you need to think about, you know, in terms of the content that you identified, the amount of content you're going to have, the type of content you're going to have, what's the appropriate host for that. You know, if you're going to have a lot of video content, probably best not to put on that, but put it on that host. You need a third party provider to, to host your video content. You're going to go with something like a Vimeo, or you're going to go with something like a Amazon S3, or some other cloud-based storage. Then we actually get into touching WordPress. Okay, so once you've got your host, you get WordPress installed. Again, we'll go through this one in more detail. I think it might even be next month, is it Chris? Yes. Yeah, so don't worry if you're not completely crossed out at the moment. It's coming up. From there, then you can choose your theme. Okay, so again, this comes down to from the cleaning, what sort of site you want, what sort of content you're having, uh, who your target market is, what they're expecting to see, that sort of thing. Um, I would normally recommend premium themes because they're better written as a, as a general rule and they provide a, a better functionality base, but there are some pretty decent free themes out there as well. Uh, as long as you're clear about what your requirements are when you're planning, you'll find a theme that's pretty close to what you want and then you can customise the, the look and feel on top of that. Uh, select the appropriate plugins. So again, depending on the functionality you're trying to have, you know, if you want a community, do you need a buddy place? Or if you want uh, a membership site, which plugin are you going to use for that? Uh, and then obviously you've got your standard ones like your backup and forms and all those sorts of things. And again, it comes down to your budget. Are you going to go free in some of those or are you going to pay for premium plugins to do it? And again, we've got a future session on plugins as well, which will help you determine which ones you probably should pay for versus which ones you probably don't have to. Um, and then the real fun begins, you can get in and customise your site. So this is where you really get to play with you know, all your colours and your fonts and really make the, the site yours, add your branding to it, etc, etc. Alright, so that's planning in a nutshell. I told you to be quick and, and try and keep it light. Um, if you need any more information, there's our site. We, uh, we actually train people in how to, to do their own WordPress sites. Um, and that planning piece is the first piece we take anyone through. Uh, in a little bit more detail than that, but um, that's the overview. Questions? Either I did a great job or I've confused the crap out of you. Any other way? I guess when uh, starting to work with a um, customer, uh, you might have a, I guess, a set of questions that you want to ask. Is there any good templates online that you can use as a bit of a survey to go and speak to customers about, you know, what are their requirements? Um, yeah, um, probably. Uh, I must admit, 
we, we've done over the years many searches and, and turned up different things, some good, some not so good. We tend to find that the better ones the agency will keep to themselves, um, because that's, that, that's what set, that sets them apart from the run of the mill. Um, we've obviously developed our own playbook based around these concepts. Um, but yeah, look, a good web, a, a Google search, and you'll turn up most of most of what you need. Um, again, if you take the points out of there and just think about that and structure something around that, you'll probably get most of the information you need from the client. The other, the other can I make a suggestion? Uh, I know that the field has to do it. It's quite a thing about the one over Some of those questions up as a pre-approval, and then we, uh, once we talk to people in more depth, we then hand out the label which goes into more depth. But yeah, that's a good way to, to start getting something to get on board. Thank you. Everything you just said applied to blogs as well as uh, business. Yeah, the first thing that struck me is that you have this very first question. Who are you targeting? And one of the things I find the hardest with writing a blog is because I don't know who my audience is. So, why are you writing your blog? Is it purely just for you to dump your ideas out or are you actually trying to reach someone? No, I spend a lot of time on travel forums answering other people's questions and putting out ideas in it, and I know who I'm talking to because they've asked the question and so on. I want to record my own travels, which I do quite a bit of, and record all that. But I don't know who's reading it. I don't know who my target is. I'm not asking you to answer no, that. No, no, no. You've just brought to my attention yeah. that, that I haven't yet identified that. So it's not about who is currently reading it. It's about who do you want to be reading it. Yes. And yes. why do you want them to be reading it. Yes. And I haven't yet. I never, never thought to even think about that. Once you think about that, and you start actually writing to well, that then, and developing the site to that, your readership will be Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Oh, I more questions than that. Well, I learned more in the last 20 minutes of whatever this you spoke than what I did for the fifteen hundred dollars build your website in a day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not surprised. There's a lot of people who will take your money and build you a website and won't even ask you those sort of questions. If uh, someone's not asking you those questions, don't ask them. Um, when it comes to things on the website, say for example, if you're starting on simple blog, mm -hmm. but you then develop it further and further, is it possible to adapt the thing uh, further on down the track where you have to really crush the thing and then redo the whole lot? Both. Um, there will come a point where uh, you will outgrow a, a basic block thing. If you go into some of these other areas like e-commerce and stuff like that, you will outgrow it. But that's fine. You know, you're not going to lose any of the content. You can re-stem it and extend it as you go. Um, that said, you know, again, it will depend on how much effort you're prepared to put into extending a theme before you say, you know what, let's start. it's time to get one that's actually dedicated and designed to do that, and then I can take that forward. So again, it comes back to some of those questions about what are you trying to achieve? Um, and then, you know, planning is not a once-off thing. You know, as, as you grow, you probably need to sit down again and go, okay, well, I've got to this point, what do I want to do next? And then start that whole process again and then determine where you go from there. You point. can also customise it with plugins too. So, I mean, there's lots of, literally thousands and thousands of plugins that add you know, functionality, functionality is to, to you. Functionality to your site. Um, so, if you've got a, um, a business site, say you're I don't know, selling services or something, yeah. um, you might have a theme, just a basic theme, but you want you want to 
like people will be able to leave um, reviews or leave testimonials or something. I mean, there's plugins that will actually add that sort of functionality to your site where either um, they can either you know, submit a form and leave a testimonial and you can approve it and it will appear on your site or, you know, there's you know, a whole bunch of different ways where you can just add them yourself and you've got them by email or something like that. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different things. That's one, of, well, that's one of the good things about WordPress. It is so flexible. I mean, when you've got a site, when you've got a thing, yeah, if you don't like it, just change it. It's all your content there. Or you can change the whole theme, or you can just build on a theme, or you can add plugins, or you can get the, get the, use the same theme and just maybe change all the colours and the styles um, to it'll, you know, freshen up. Um, there's literally dozens and dozens of things you can do to you know, change it, make it work differently, or make it look differently. Just on that, um, you know, growing as well, trends change in web all the time, okay? So, you know, you're not going to design or build a site now, it's not going to be there for the next 20 years. If you think it's going to be there for 20 years, you're probably kidding yourself. Um, you know, we, we probably refresh our site more often than most because that's the business we're in. But really, you know, every couple of years you should be thinking it's time for a bit of a, a fresh up, whether that's just a, you know, a makeover of the current theme or whether that's a new theme with a new look. That's really what you have to determine, yes. You actually mentioned having two or three or four sites. Yep. For different applications. Um, so they're all the same theme? So the person feels like they're going from one page to another, they're on the same website? Or do you do different themes? Um, and do you host differently? Does each one get hosted separately or...? They can. I, I personally tend to do them as um, subdomains of the one on like, so I'll have my main domain and then I'll have subdomains for members or whatever. Are they different sites? They're Is different WordPress name? installs, yes. Uh, they are generally on the same host. Again, it doesn't have to be, but it's just easier to do that way. And I haven't grown to the point where, you know, I've got so much traffic going through a site that really needs its own hosting. Um, so, so there's different ways to do that. Um, in terms of theme, um, not always. What I try and do is keep a consistent element through them so that they know it's all part of the one group, but because they're sort of targeted at a specific uh, different group, I don't mind having a different theme and a different actual look to it. Um, so, you know, you bring your logo through, you bring your colours through, but if it's laid out differently, that's fine because this is the membership site and that's the domain site sort of thing. Okay. So, yeah, you're not constrained. Um, building on that, have you used kind of multi-user versions of WordPress? to build that out? Um, Say if you were building an authority site that was yes. membership, e-commerce, all the works. Yep, um, that is one option. <coughs> um, I went down that path with a client that we were working with. Uh, their intent was to have a whole bunch of sub-sites. Uh, personally, we found that it was just a kill for what they were trying to do in the end. They didn't grow to a massive number of sites, so only three or four in the end anyway. Um, and so we backed all that out and wanted to sites. Um, there's a number of plugins and third-party services these days which we may get into when we talk about plugins and stuff, um, where you can actually manage multiple sites with one dashboard. Yeah. So you can set it up so you know, if you manage WP, Infinite WP, things like that, you set it up so you log into one place, you can update all of your sites, you can add content to different sites, etc. Et so it's not as cumbersome as it used to be. Any other questions? Alright, I reckon it's time we head to the pub then. <laughs> <laughs>